you might think of what you, uh, you say, you know, we didn't really need this. If there's something that I've taught that you say really extraneous, we didn't need it, uh, let me know. If there's something you say, I wish you'd add this. Any feedback you can give me that would help me to do a better job at this would be greatly appreciated. So uh, certainly welcome your input. Uh, I've subtitled this Living as Lambs in the Midst of Wolves because this is w- what we should do. question is, what should we do? Yes. Corbin, yes, sir. You know, my vocabulary is a problem. I am so sorry. <laughs> well, you know, Oh, I'll tell you, it reminds me of a, an experience which is a very, uh, you know, when I first came here, I taught through the book of Revelation, and it, by consensus, it was a disaster. And I've never listened to any of those sermons, and so I went back recently because James wanted me to uh, uh, give him a list of what the sermons are so they could index them on our our, uh, our uh, website. And one of them I didn't know, and I listened to it, and it was on the book of Revelation. I thought, you know, it really wasn't that bad. I don't know what people were squawking about. Uh, just a lack of interest in the subject, I guess. But um, anyway, I'm sorry about the big words. Talk. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, and my flipper, Ben, is not responding to commands. There we go. I base the subtitle on this verse, Jesus talking to his disciples, and it's something that we in our culture have had the privilege of not having to apply to ourselves for many, many years. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Uh, Think of that metaphor. Jesus kind of mixed this metaphor there with the different animals. But can you imagine if you are a sheep that finds that you've wandered into a wolf pack? That is the biblical picture of the world we live in. We've had an unusual situation in America for several hundred years, and we have come to think that that is the norm. It has seldom been the norm for Christians. It is not the norm for Christians all over the world. It is becoming the norm for us. And it's going to take some getting used to as realizing that I cannot uh, behave as though I still own the status quo. The church cannot behave as though our truth claims are self-evident. And he says, okay, what does a sheep do in that situation? It learns to be as clever as a serpent. Aren't those things sneaky? Have you ever been surprised by a snake in the grass? Uh, Charlene, I know, has. Uh, You know, how did it get up on me so close? How did it get so near and I didn't notice? Because they're sneaky. Here's a crevice. Uh, here's a place to hide. Innocent. As my friend Deepak said, in India, we do the same things as other people, but it is they make a big issue out of it when we do it. Innocence is going to be uh, extremely important. Not fitting their stereotype. Not making yourself the targets so that they can point at you. See what I said? He's just what I said, isn't he? He's a bad person. Uh, I remember the funeral director in Ogallala for a while. He was having my friend Eric preach. I love Eric, and Eric always preaches the gospel. That's what I like about Eric. But he doesn't make any apology for it. He just, so you get a total stranger, they're going to get a gospel message. They got that from me too. But he quit having Eric because Eric was offending people at these funerals. He said, I want you to do it. He says, you say the same thing as Eric. You're just sneaky about it. 
That's not bad. We just have to learn how to present our message, same message, but with a little more subtlety than we are used to. Here's another verse that is important. Proverbs uh, 3, 25 and 26. Do not be afraid of sudden fear, nor of the onslaught of the wicked when it comes. Notice it doesn't say if it comes. Uh, For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. It's a wonderful concept to understand. Don't be afraid of sudden fear. Things are happening and suddenly I'm afraid. I was comfortable in this culture. Now I see things happening and suddenly I'm afraid. Uh, Don't be afraid. The onslaught of the wicked is going to come. Especially if we're living in the last days. There's nothing we can do. These things must come to pass. Uh, So what do we do? Our confidence must be in the Lord. Our confidence must be that the Lord is going to win this thing. I am on the right side. And truth will prevail in the end. But we're going to go through some dark days before that happens. But I'm in this for the long haul. And I'm trusting the Lord. This is what I try to do on a daily basis as I teach in a sec- on a secular campus. To be wise as a serpent, gentle as a dove. Trust the Lord. Have confidence in Him. That He will keep my foot from being caught. Some personal observations for what they're worth. As I look at what's happening in the world today, I tend to react with both distress and alarm, in spite of what I just said. I see what's happening, and almost every day I'm alarmed at some new outrage. And uh, yes, I fight depression. You know, blessed are they that mourn, uh, they shall take antidepressants. At the present moment, I'm experiencing more anguish in my soul than at any point during my lifetime. And I quoted, blessed are they that mourn. That's what it's talking about. It's not talking about people that have lost a loved one. It's talking about people that look around at what is happening in this sin-cursed, broken world. And they mourn. And there is coming a day when we who see and mourn, when we who allow our hearts to be broken by the things that break the heart of God, will be comforted. Part of my anguish, though, comes not from what's happening in the world, but from Christians. I grieve over the fact that Christians don't understand what's happening. That's why I put together this seminar. Sometimes I just want to scream, don't you understand? When I see the way Christians are responding, I just I just am so frustrated. And like that song we heard, uh, Bob Dylan, one of the good things that came out of the 60s, uh, you better start swimming or you're going to sink like a stone. I, I want to scream that. Uh, the onslaught of the wicked is upon us. It's like a, a raging torrent. You've got to start swimming. Or you're going to be buried. I'm also distressed over the lack of understanding, but at a general lack of interest in these things. Now, I'm, uh, thank God that each of you are here. Do you think maybe more should be? Some can't be. Some can't be. I understand that. Some are going to be listening to it, and they have ordered the workbooks. They just couldn't be here. We've advertised it. It's been on the radio. Why the lack of interest? I don't understand it, and it grieves me. Yeah, we don't. So um, it's very easy to feel like we are a paper um, paper ship in a river. We can't swim against the current. It's a sense of helplessness 
I can't do anything, so I might as well just drift out uh, Yeah, I, you know, I think this is one thing with Americans, too. Americans are, by nature, an optimistic people. It's part of our culture. And uh, Obed, who's come from another culture, can see that. Americans like to be able to fix things. And uh, to be told there's nothing, it can't be fixed. You have to learn to live as sheep in the midst of the wolves because the wolves are not going away. That goes so contrary to the American spirit. You know, we tamed a continent for crying out loud. We went to the moon. Uh, it's hard for Americans. This distresses me because because people aren't aware they're being drawn into this postmodern mindset. You see it on in Christian literature. You see it among Christian people. The culture is postmodern in its thinking, and increasingly Christians are postmodern in their thinking too. And I could weep. Uh, I'm distressed because of our ignorance of the culture makes us ineffective in our witness. We're answering questions the world is not asking in a manner which it no longer understands. People don't understand how to communicate with the world because we as Christians have isolated ourselves in our own subcultures. And it all makes sense within our subcultures. And we don't understand the world. How do we expect to be able to be effective lights and witnesses if we don't understand the world we're living in? I'm especially distressed that many in the church who do understand the most the postmodern shift are embracing it rather than resisting it. This is what I was talking about in the literature. Uh, I've been reading, as I've taken courses at Liberty University of all places, started by Jerry Falwell. This is an example of a, a Christian writer. In 1517, Martin Luther wrote 95 theses and posted them on the door of the church and started a reformation. I post these 95 postmodern theses on the internet in hopes of waking people to the coming changes in the church. While we admit that most of the strives made in the postmodern movement are made in our generation, we refuse to label the movement a generational movement. It is beyond our generations. It's beyond social class, beyond race. It's a God thing. Uh, I, I've just introduced you a little bit to postmodernism. There's truth in it, especially if there's no God, but that's the problem. There's no God in their equation. And to say that postmodernism is a God thing, I just want to go do some primal screaming in the woods somewhere. No, it's not. It is opposed to our God. It's one of those ideologies and strongholds that we as Christians are commanded to break down uh, going on with the same thing. Uh, those who are embracing the spirit of the age, postmodernism, what do they believe? They believe that Christian theolo theology must abandon its residual attachments uh, to modernism. Having accepted the postmodern view of language, some are claiming that our emphasis on the Bible as propositional revelation is questionable or wrong and that we need to reevaluate our view of scriptures. Uh, community should take precedence over doctrinal pronouncements. It will not endure sound doctrine comes to mind. Theology should be uh, primarily narrative in nature, not systematic, abstract, or conceptual. Telling the Christian Story should replace stipulating Christian doctrine. Uh, those who embrace postmodernism are saying, we believe that our traditional defenses of the faith, based on appeals to logic, which is now viewed as just a social construct, it needs to be rejected. And historical facts, which have now been declared to be unknowable, 
must be replaced with a defense that answers to the spirit of our time. Uh, they propose a person-centered apologetic that aims to remain faithful to the gospel while ensuring that it fully addresses the contemporary situation. They say that we do not need to reject Christianity's truth claims, but we do need to realize that it is now bad tactics to major on the question of truth. If we're going to get a hearing in today's culture, we need to be able to show uh, that Christianity has something relative, relevant and attractive to offer. Uh, some have even <clears throat> advised abandoning the notion of rational cogency, objective truth, and an emphasis on propositions in favor of a more communal, experiential kind of apologetic that emphasizes authenticity rather than absolutes, as if the two areas were mutually exclusive. Uh, some are saying we recognize that the culture views evangelism as proselytizing, and that's obnoxious. No matter how gently we attempt to win others to Christ, it's obnoxious. And this gives people the impression that we think Christianity is superior to their belief system. Otherwise, uh, we wouldn't be trying to win converts. So the idea is let's quit trying to end when converts, and let's just do nice things. In the book on Christian, there was a guy who says, well, I'm going over on my mission trip, we're going to dig a well. If someone comes to Christ, I have an opportunity to share, that's great. Uh, but at least I will have dug a well. Okay, that's good. That's not Christian missions. As a matter of fact, I'll go so bold as to say this. Those on believers in the village that didn't hear the gospel from him will someday curse him on the day of judgment that he knew and didn't share the gospel that he gave them water while withholding the living water from them uh, we need to recognize that if Christianity is presented as something superior or something true it's necessarily saying that it propose, what we propose is going to replace something inferior. We need to recognize that efforts at evangelism are obnoxious, arrogant, intolerant. Believing then, according to Thesis 2 of O'Keefe's 95 Postmodern Thesis, that the community of faith must be relevant, postmodern Christians believe that Christians should refuse to gauge in any overt evangelism and accept as a demonstration of the Christian life in the hope that others will simply ask them what makes them tick, which will give them the opportunity to share their story and talk about Jesus Christ. If someone then opts at that point to become a Christian, that's fair. No one's telling them that their own way is inferior or that they're lost. Rather, we have simply decided to try this new Christian way. The reason for doing so is not that uh, the Christian way is true, but that it seems attractive, at least to some people. Why not give it a try? Thus, people are won by existential things like uh, feelings, aesthetics, personal relationships, mysticism, unexplained leaps, coincidences, and a pan, uh, pan a panoply of other subjective perceptions. What does panoply mean? Many things, a whole collection of things. Yes? Same question, okay. So these days I find myself more and more haunted by Jesus' ominous question to his disciples. When the Son of Man comes, will he even find faith in the earth? If the approach being advocated by these postmodern Christians is the wrong approach, then what's the right approach? How should we respond to the postmodern shift? Well, the church is in need of true men of Issachar. This is the first thing. Uh, this comes from 1 Chronicles 12.32. The sons of Issachar were particularly helpful to David because they understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do. Men of Issachar have both. 
They understand the times and they know what the people of God should do. Uh, we need to recognize that not everyone who understands the times is a true son of Issachar. There's a lot of people who understand the postmodern shift and are embracing it and saying that that's what the church needs to do. That if we are living in a postmodern culture, we need a postmodern gospel. We need a postmodern approach to postmodern men rather than a countercultural approach that rebukes the culture. So, uh, not everyone that understands the culture is a man of Issachar. I remember in Ogallala, before we merged with the Free Church, they had a youth pastor and he took me out to lunch and says, I, I want to talk to you. You understand postmodernism. Eric doesn't get it. And I, I, you know, that's very flattering. You know, when you're told you're superior than another preacher, you, you know, swell up pretty quick. And uh, then one day uh, we were in the church and he said something that was an absolute denial of church. Eric was there. I said, fire him. Oh, Carlton. He did end up having a lot of problems. Because a guy had gone over to the other side. And he finally left to go to Atlanta to start a postmodern church. Uh, so, a lot of people that understand the times think the answer is to capitulate. Uh, what should we do? Isaiah 8.20, to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to the word, it is because they have no dawn. One of the things we need to do is to look for men then that are teaching and preaching the Word of God as truth. In an age in which telling the truth is a revolutionary act, we need men who are revolutionary enough to tell the truth, to preach the truth, to proclaim it. And this is what we need to seek out and find. They will ultimately be the men of Issachar. So we need to understand people that, that have correctly exegeted the times, and then have taken the time to exegete the Word of God so that they understand both the times and the Word of God, and they can teach us from the Word of God what we should do in every season or every situation that we will face along the way. Yes? Exegesis, Exegesis means to be able to divide and take apart and understand its meaning. Why did you say that? <laughs> Too many words. When one word will work, why use five? Because you're heading it up saying that anyway. You're already English. Yeah. A true man of Issachar knows the times, and he knows that in times like this we need the Bible. Is that plain enough? And as we as believers need to refer, we need to individually refer our commitment to a foundational principle. God's word is truth. It's not our truth. It's not a truth. It is the truth. We have to have a rock-solid commitment to that. The verse we had in first ses uh, with the music in the first session goes on to say, talks about how these men of the last day are going to be, but then the chapter ends with all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. In the next chapter, therefore preach the word. We need to have a commitment to the Word of God as truth. In his prophetic little book, How Shall We Then Live?, Francis Schaeffer, who I regard as a true man of Issachar, he not only understood the times, but he anticipated the postmodern shift before it happened. And he gave the church excellent counsel and a special note to Christians at the end of his book. That's what he said. We must be careful not to fall into our own existential methodology. And what he's referring to, existential is a word, it has to do with existential philosophy. He knew it was, what, such a philosophy was coming. Postmodernism had not yet been articulated. That's what we have. And he warned us against using the world's methods, sanctifying, baptizing the world's methods. We do this if we try to hold... Uh, if we try to keep hold of the value system, the meaning system, the religious matters given in the Bible while playing down what the Bible affirms about the cosmos, history, and specific commands in morals. Uh, Schaefer died in the 19, early 80s. Uh, we didn't have 
the redefinition of marriage happening then. The gays hadn't begun to demand it yet. They haven't demanded it from the very beginning. But Schaefer says you can't hold on to the truth of the Bible if you downplay what it says. He goes on. He says we are following our own form of existentialist methodology, or we could put in the postmodern methodology. If we put what the Bible says about the cosmos, history, and absolute uh, commands and morals in the realm of the culturally oriented. He's warning against postmodernism before it came on the scene. He's saying we cannot, uh, if if we say it's all cultural, if we buy into the cultural pronouncements of the time, then we're going to lose the truth. If we do this, the generation that follows, that would be Generation X and the Millennials, will certainly be undercut as far as historic Christianity is concerned. He saw it coming. He says, what's going to happen if we begin to use the world's methods, if we begin to buy into the philosophies of this world, then we are going to see to it that the next generations of Christians reject biblical Christianity. If we ourselves bear the central mark of our generation, we cannot be the voice that we should be to our poor fractured generation. We cannot be restorative salt, which Christians are supposed to be, to their generation and their culture if in regard to the scriptures we too are marked by existentialist or post-cultural, post-modern Methodology. This is so simple. Let me. One of Schaefer's problems is he couldn't break things down. He had too big a vocabulary too. Here's what he's saying in a nutshell: You can't reach the world for Christ if you're just like them. There's nothing different. It's just more of the same. He says, if we are so marked, we have really no absolute by which to help or by which to judge the culture, the state, or society. And what he is saying is, if we buy into this thing, we're not going to be able to make any moral judgments either. Truth is lost. As Christians, we are not only to know the right worldview, but consciously act upon that worldview so as to influence society in all its parts and facets across the whole spectrum of its life as much as we can to the extent of our individual and collective ability. He said it is not enough to know what we know, we must live it. We must take what we know and live it in whatever cultural setting we find itself. The challenge when you find yourselves among wolves is to retain your identity as a sheep. And this is what uh, Lucy was talking before. If we read the Bible, how we are going to act upon what the Bible said. Right. So when we look at the time of slavery, the time of our industrial revolution with gratitude to such Christians as Elizabeth Fry and Lord Shaftesbury and William Wilberforce and others who spoke out and acted publicly against slavery and against uncompassionate use of accumulated wealth, will future generations be thankful that in our day we did the same sort of thing? talking about an earlier time there was slavery and in England there were these brave evangelicals who boldly spoke out against it even though it was against the culture and we look back and say what great men and women they are what will future generations say about us are we speaking out against the sins of the culture or are we with the wisdom Subtlety as, as serpents, gentle as doves. Or were, were we just part of the problem? Should that even be our goal, though? What future generations, or should our goal be what, we, what God says about us? Well, I think Schaefer would agree with you completely. I think he was making the point, what, what is going to be said of us in the future? Uh, this is our chance to represent Christ in our generation. How are we doing what will Christ say on the day we stand before him? 
And, and see, the thing about that verse I quoted at the beginning of this, Behold, I send you out as sheep. It isn't that we've just wandered into a pack of sheep. Jesus himself has sent us into the midst of the wolves. And there we are to be sheep, though surrounded by wolves, acting with subtlety and purity. And what is our response? We don't want to be out there. Let's come in, build a round wall around ourselves, we'll stay together in our little subculture. We'll be okay. Yes? Look, I have a little trouble. I understand about being amongst the wolves and whatnot. I used to be in, in the sheep business. We didn't have wolves. We had a lot of coyote trouble. Almost as bad. Yeah, I never saw a lamb yet that had a half a chance. No. How do you, how do you, I, I don't understand how to do that. I understand uh, I understand shooting coyotes, but I don't understand how that lamb <laughs> Stand for truth and be. Uh, and make it. I mean, that almost sounds like we're supposed to be non confrontational. Well, here's, here's the deal. Here's the clue. Uh, let me answer it as directly as I can. We don't have to survive. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you get this? What, where do you get this thing that that the goal is to survive the experience? Yeah. <laughs> Bert. I, I kind of have, have had the same thoughts, but I guess I come back to the Lord saying that He is our shepherd mm-hmm. and He will protect us. Yeah. Behold, I will be with you always. Even at the moment of death and martyrdom. Yeah. You see the call to us is to be faithful to our God in a time such as this, to be willing to bear the reproach of men, to be willing to endure marginalization, possibly persecution and death itself. If we are willing to accept this, we can achieve greatness in our time. We have the opportunity to be as great as any Christian generation that has preceded us. But it's not going to be easy. Lucy? There's a song that says that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It isn't always in the, the Eastern Church. The martyrs got wiped out. The church got wiped out. So sometimes it has been. Uh, sometimes it has not. Whether God uses our blood as the seed of the church is his business. Our business is to be faithful. Don't we still have to stand against evil? Yeah, but, but how do we do it? That's the big thing. Let me finish some of this, and then we'll talk about some of the specific practical questions. We're not excused from speaking just because culture and society no longer rests as much as it once did on Christian thinking, but we must be realistic and understand that doing this may be costly. That's the answer. But in, in the battle, we're going to learn some things about the Lord, about ourselves, that we didn't know before. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, that cost might be our life. Yeah. Yeah, and in the situation I'm in now, I may not, at some point in time, some student may complain, I may get in trouble, I may not have this uh, job, this anticipated new career. I could lose it at any time, I know that. But that cannot be my worry. Yeah. My worry must be, and it's hard but must be that I must be faithful in proclaiming truth to a generation that desperately needs it. Isn't that what it all comes down to? As Americans, we've been taught all our lives that it's all about us. And so that notion that we sacrifice our life for Christ just as he sacrificed our, his life for us is a foreign concept even for us in the church and that we might have to give up everything we have to serve Christ and we can't pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps is yes. a totally foreign concept and even the church would fight against it. Yeah, and, and again, if the shepherd says, I send you into the wolves, 
we go. And you say, but sheep don't have a chance. That's where the shepherd sent us. It's where he placed us. We were born in this time, this culture. We were born for a time such as this. We are the generation that must face these issues as generations before us have faced their issues. And the challenge in every generation is the same. What should we do? We must be faithful. We must be faithful to the Word of God. We must be faithful to God. We must be faithful to Christ. Just reading the Gospels, or not the Gospels, but um, uh, what happened to the disciples. Yeah. He sent them as sheep in the midst of wolves, and the wolves killed them all. But they were faithful. And because they were faithful, we're here today. As Christians. And, and I'll... Oops. Knocked over my water, but it, the lid was on. How wise of me. If the approach being advocated by postmodern Christians is wrong, okay, the church needs men of Issachar. We need a historic perspective, and we've had that stated. We need to realize that we've faced this before. Church has faced other things like this. Edward Gibbons, enemy of Christianity, wrote this in his decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, Schaefer says, uh, it is a quote from Schaefer, said that the following five attributes marked Rome at its end. First was a mounting love of show and luxury, that is, affluence. Second, a widening gap between the very rich and very poor. This could be among countries in the family of nations as well in a single nation. Third, an obsession with sex. Fourth, freakishness in the arts, masquerading as inner originality and enthusiasms pretending to be creativity. Fifth, an increased desire to live off the state. If all this sounds so familiar, we have come back, come a long road, and we are back in Rome. That's a historic perspective. To realize that we've won this long, winding road, and guess what? what? Christianity finds itself where it started. In such a culture. Here's a thoughtful uh, and analysis of another man of Issachar. This is Jeffrey Satin over the best book on homosexuality and the Christian response to it I've ever read. Uh, I have given away more copies. I'm going to quit buying them because I can't keep them. But Homosexuality and the Politics of Truth is the name of his book. He says, 400 years of growing religious skepticism among our elites and of stupendous technological progress in which faith appears irrelevant has laid us open to alternative spiritualities. For a time, it seemed as if the materialistic worldview would triumph, but in fact, the spiritual desert did not produce a sense of mature comfort and spiritual abstinence. Instead, it generated an intense new thirst for the spiritual, any spirit that would slake our thirst. Thus, the emerging dominant spirit of our age is not the skeptical one that denigrates all religion, but rather a profoundly and perennial religious spirit that stands opposed to the ethical monotheism of the Christian faith. The tenets of the newly emerging religion, whether articulated deliberately or merely at work tacitly in the background, are coming swiftly to dominate our public morality. But the religion itself is not really new. Neither are its theological beliefs. It's simply the reemergence of paganism. And its beliefs are Gnosticism. Saying the same thing as Schaefer, we've come full circle. What we are facing is what the first church faced as the gospel of Christ went out into the Greco-Roman world. There is nothing new under the sun. This is what they believed. They were a bunch of cultural and moral relativists. Tolerance was, as it's understood today, was the glue that kept the very diverse Roman Empire together. Uh, the whole theory was, uh, believe whatever you want, but agree that everyone else is okay too. It was Christianity's exclusiveness that got them into trouble. All they would have had to do was tip the hat to the imperial cult. We're full circle. We've been here before. And somehow, where, where's the Roman Empire today? Where's the 
first Christianity. It's still here. It will be. Christ will win. Part of paganism's appeal stems from the fact that pagan spirituality makes few moral demands on the individual. Thus, it's more tolerant of human differences. That is diversity. But the reverse side of paganism is a deficient concept of evil. Okay? Nothing's evil. If everything's acceptable, there's no evil anymore. There's no sexual immorality. There's just sex. If the approach is wrong, then the church is in desperate need of two men's of Issachar. We need this historical perspective. And since the first church faced the same challenges we face today, we need to examine the texts which were produced at that time to see if they give us any instruction as how we should respond. If they face the same challenges we face, then the New Testament is more relevant than it's ever been. Because it was written against the background of a culture that was almost identical to the pagan culture we are facing today. And all of the instruction that was given in the New Testament to believers was given to people facing the challenges we're facing. In these chapters, uh, first uh, the analysis we looked at, First and Second Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 3 and 4, rather, in these chapters, Paul gives a chilling description of the condition of the human race prior to the second coming of Christ. We, we saw that as we listened to uh, Mr. Dillon sing. Uh, we learn about the state of the human race at the end of the age. We learn about the state of spirituality at the end of the age, a form of godliness, but having denied the power thereof. Uh, that's the picture of end-time religion. We read about the false teachers that are going to be on the scene at the end of the age. Uh, we have even more specificity given uh, in the fourth chapter where we're told that people are going to be rejecting sound doctrine and seeking teachers having itching ears. In these chapter, Paul then gives us a detailed instruction as to what we should expect and how we should minister during these difficult days. In the last days, perilous time will come. And he gives detailed instruction as to what we should do if we find ourselves in such a time. First, 310, we need to continue in the apostolic teaching we have received and follow the God, godly example left to us by the Apostle Paul and his fellow apostles. It's the first thing he tells Timothy. He tells him these bad days are going to come, it's going to get worse and worse. Evil is going to be bad from, go from bad to worse. Everyone's going to be rejecting the truth, looking for teachers that are going to itch their ears. He says, this is the first thing you need to do. You need to retain the teaching you've received. The apostles got it right. And you need to follow their example. Uh, we should anticipate persecution. Because he says, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted in the last days. So, if we're living in the last days, gulp. All who desire to live godly. Not people that are, are going around preaching, but even those who have a desire to live a godly life in such a time are going to experience persecution because of it, and we should be ready to follow the example of the apostles. Uh, we should have a steadfast commitment to the tradition that's been passed down to us. We should have a steadfast commitment to the Word of God. We need to have confidence and power that it can give us, the Scriptures can give us the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, we need to have confidence in its source. All Scripture is God-breathed and is uh, useful for rebuke, exhortation, so forth. We need to have confidence in the sufficiency of the Word of God, that it has all that we need to be thoroughly equipped for godly living in such a time. And we should recognize that we have been given a solemn charge to preach the Word. or to preach it in season and out of season, when it's popular and when it's unpopular. Uh, we, our preaching should include reproofs, rebukes, exhortation. Our preaching should be marked by patience, and doctrine, which is really kind of crazy because we just heard that the world is not going to endure sound doctrine. And so what he's saying is they don't want it, preach it anyway. 
It's not about who has the biggest crowd. It is who is most faithful to the charge we have been given. And even though there will be no demand for sound doctrine, preach it anyway. Our charge is to give the world what it needs, not what it wants. And the evangelical church's deliberate disobedience and compromise in this area is, in my opinion, one of the most troubling of all the things that are happening in our world today. We are the world's monkey. What do you want us to do? You want us to dance, we'll dance. You want us to climb a wall, we'll climb a wall. You tell us what you want, world, we'll do what you want us to do. We're also told that we need to be sober in all things. That means we're to be serious-minded. We're told that we're going to need to endure hardships, and we're told that we need to do the work of evangelist, even though the world thinks it's rude and cultural imperialism or whatever. We are to share the gospel. Some will be saved. Most will not. But we preach for those who will be. And then he says, Fulfill your ministry you've received from the Lord. Fight the good face. Finish the course. Keep the faith. This is the answer. I wish I could give you uh, more. How do we sustain ourselves at such a time? Well, such a time, Jeremiah saw his whole civilization fall apart, and he says, I recall this to my mind, therefore I have hope. The steadfast, the Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases. His compassions never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I have hope in him. The Lord is good for those who wait for him. To the person who seeks him. It is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. I love that. Because of who God is, I have hope. And that is it. Questions? No the, triumphalism here. And then the rapture will come, right? In view of all of this, do you think... Our word will come. Pardon me? Our word will come and win. Yeah, but do you think then that... Uh, um, the rapture will come at the, in the middle of a, the tribulation, or all of this. Uh, that's when I. That's when I believe it'll come. Yeah. I think the church has some dark days. Judgment begins where, according to Peter, at the house of the Lord. Before Judd, God takes care of the house of the wicked, He's going to clean His own house. Yes. Do you guess that the great falling away has already occurred? Or is it- it's happening. Postmodernism is producing it. The sorts of things we talked about here is the essence of it. I've heard it speculated or said that uh, this expectation to be raptured before the tribulation starts could be the cause of the great falling away. Once we see that we have to endure some of the. Oh, I think some will fall away. They always do when persecution starts. It's not a bad thing for the church. Church is a better place. (laughs) And again, I would encourage you to read the New Testament with fresh eyes. Read it as a document written to Christians who were living in a culture like our own. And then everything in it tells you how we as believers, as a church, are to be what we're to be doing in times like this. Other questions? That's why I, I probably I'll never write books. books. Books are always supposed to end triumphantly, right? And it will. It will. But not yet. I have a question, just, and it, it's the. What is your opinion on that? Um, 
work that won't issue gay, um, gay marriage licenses and how the courts have handled that? Well, I think, uh, I think the woman should have resigned. Uh, she should have. She was very, apparently very popular. She should have issued a statement as to why. This was a job her mother had held before her. Her son was being replaced, groomed to be her ultimate replacement. And she needs to say that she can very wisely word the document. This is one of the things we need to learn to do is how to present this homosexuality with wisdom. We need to know what they're saying to be able to handle it. And I think the I think Ben uh, Carson has handled it very well as he's been asked about it. And I I, I think uh, what we need to do is is we need to uh, say something to this effect. Uh, you know there are many things in the gay agenda that I as a Christian can agree with. I don't believe anyone should be bullied, persecuted. I believe people ought to be able to free their own lives. But as a Christian, there are certain things Christians have believed about marriage for. A couple thousand years, and the Jews believe that. In a couple thousand years, for a couple thousand years before us, and we believe that marriage is an institution that was created by God and defined by God, and it has to do with family, not love. It has to do with the production and raising of children, and some of us Christians believe that marriage is even sacramental, and so. Even though I would certainly be with you if you were standing against bullying, or if you were saying that you were being denied job opportunities that you were otherwise qualified for just because of your sexual proclivities, I'm with you there. I can't be with you on the issue of marriage. Mainly because of this. Jesus spoke to the issue. And what you're asking me to do is to say Jesus was wrong. As a Christian, I just can't do that. Even though I care about you and don't in any way want to hurt you, you're asking me to do something that as a Christian I cannot do. I cannot bring myself to say Jesus was wrong in what he taught about marriage. That makes it a different issue, doesn't it? Because we're in the middle of wolves. <laughs> and he was he was speaking that as he was speaking that of making revelation for a theocratic nation that he was creating. We're not there. We won't be there until Christ returns. We have no theocracy. And we are this is what I'm saying, we are sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise and gentle. Why must we be gentle about it? Because we were commanded to be. The servant of God must be must not strive, but must be gentle. I don't want to be gentle either. Uh, it's not my nature. I was created to be a warrior, but there's a way to fight the war that is effective, and there's a way to fight the war that is not. For the gay activists, there's nothing I could say that it will satisfy them. But for others who have been deceived by their rhetoric, I'm giving them something to think about that they would not think about. They already have me pegged as a hater. They already, I've broken the rule of intolerance as far as they're concerned. And so what I have to do is I have to be uh, gentle. But evil is still evil. It's still evil, but it do, if I get up and say it's evil, how, what is that going to do? It makes me feel better, perhaps, because I've spoke my mind. But who's it going to persuade? If we'd have been saying evil was evil a hundred years ago, we might not be in the jam that we're in right now. But we're in this jam. That's true. <laughs> And we can't go back and say what we should have said 100 years ago and redo that. We're where we are now. And so now, we have to be learn to be very wise. And we are commanded to be gentle. And it goes against my nature. Anyone knows me knows in my Facebook I've had to tone back because I just come across meaner than I want to. I'm not trying to be, but that's the way my writing is because I tend to be so frank in my writing. 
But if I'm pushing away the very people I desire to reach, what am I accomplishing? See what I'm saying? Uh, are you going to reach them anyway? Yeah, you do. You think so? Yeah. You moderate their position. You, you win a, the opportunity to be heard again. That's what Paul did on Mars Hill. Paul went in and he, he gave his presentation on Mars Hill. And as soon as they, they got to the gospel, they started scoffing, tuned him off. But some said, we'll hear you again about this matter. That's what you want. Yes? One of the things that I have read lately is that, and he speak to me because I am like you, but I don't have a problem until you a person for a key which you need to, to hear. But in doing that, sometimes I lost the relationship. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what I, I have come to the conclusion that we need to state the truth in a way that we can keep the relationship open because we are the business of reaching people for Christ. So we are not doing I am not doing my job as a Christian is I say what I believe and people got rejected because of what, the way how I said it. Not because what I say was wrong, it's because the way how I said it was yeah. improper. I remember I, I was blogging, or not blogging, but uh, writing columns on a, a Huffington Post or something. They had an article on the gay issue. And I said, she, they were talking about Christians and the Christian response. And, you know, I says, here's the deal. As a Christian, whether, I am, whether you're gay, whether you're straight, however you define yourself, it's interesting but unimportant. We all have the same responsibility according to Scripture, and that is to learn how to possess our vessel in sanctification and honor and not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who have no knowledge of God. I says, now, depending on what my particular predilections are, I'm going to have areas of struggle. Uh, the goal is the same. If I call myself a Christian, then this is my responsibility, sanctification, honor, purity. And this guy then answered, says, as long as you're not saying... Uh, gay guy answers, as long as you're saying homosexuality isn't a sin, I'm fine with that. I says, you know what? I says, I'm not going to say that. Why don't you read the scriptures for yourself and see what it says? Because if you're a Christian, you have to submit to whatever the Word of God says. I, for example, might have a natural tendency toward adultery, but I cannot go there and achieve purity. Uh, a lot of people put likes on a secular post uh, because I had refused to play into their stereotype. And even what I said, look for the scriptures, what do they say? I'm not going to judge you, what does the scripture say? And... Uh, I believe I'm doing the right thing. Jesus in John 12 uh, ran into people that rejected what he said. Here's truth. He says, "I don't, I don't, uh, I don't judge them." He says, I, you know, his, "His thing was to come and to say, not to condemn and, and judge." Yeah. As he was on the earth, he never judged that he was the truth. And if he's not going to judge, then why do I? And the Apostle Paul says, what do we have to judge those who are without? Our responsibility is to judge those who are part of our group. God will judge those without. And so, uh, you know, ours, you have to be so wise. Or you end up hurting the cause of Christ. And uh, when you are me, I was born to be a warrior and fight. <laughs> but uh, I have to learn how to fight with 